Well, thank you so much again for joining us, and I hope you enjoyed that first recital. I know I did. It was wonderful. Um, I enjoyed editing that footage, watching these recitals before you all got to see them. But it's beautiful performances by everybody there. Um, we have three presentations, so we'll get started with that. And I'm going to ask you to please keep your microphone muted. And if you'd like to minimize the cameras on screen, if you could turn your camera off, that would help us out a little bit. Um, we're going to get started with a presentation by Laura Grantier on anatomy and physiology of the sympathetic nervous system. And she'll tell you a little bit more about what all that means. Uh, so, um, Bob, if you're ready to keep track of time, we will get started right now with Laura's presentation. I, I got my timekeeper thing going. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. Actually, I'm, it's still morning here um, on Pacific time, but um, good afternoon. I'm very pleased to be here. And um, this topic about performance anxiety is very near and dear to my heart because, um, well, I mean, I've just had to manage it my whole my whole career as a student. And now I'm trying to teach my own students how to manage it. But one of the things I did last year, or in 2020 to 2021, is I took um, a whole year, two semesters of anatomy and physiology, because I basically wanted to understand why the body does what it does. And first and foremost, I'll just say that we are small muscle athletes. So, you know, the, the things that we need to do to train and prepare our, our bodies to perform and make music um, well, the, the body has a, a trigger and a system for everything that we do. So it's really quite amazing what we can do and how we can do it. So I'm going to share my screen and start my presentation. Um, let's see. Okay. So, so I'm going to talk about kind of the anatomy, which is, you know, where these nerve fibers kind of live in our bodies that kind of trigger our fight or flight response system. Um, let me just stop my share and go into, let's see, here, here we go. All right. So, so we're going to talk about what is performance anxiety. I kind of want to give you an overview of the um, central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system and then the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system, and then the physiology of fight or flight. And if you have any questions, please post them in the chat or come off mute at the end, and, and I'll um, be happy to, to answer them for you. So we talk about performance anxiety, stress and anxiety, um, performing in front of people, what, it, what happens to your body, confronting your fears and vul vulnerabilities, and accepting yourself for who you are, and not feeling like you have to prove yourself to others. So um, just keeping in mind that no one is perfect. We all make mistakes. Um, sometimes our body can betray us even when we, we are trying to be focused and trying to do the very best that we can. So what are the symptoms are of performance anxiety? I'm sure you've all experienced this. I know I have. We have a racing pulse, um, rapid breathing, dry mouth, trembling hands or knees or lips or voice if you're a singer, um, cold, I get cold hands, sweaty, cold hands, um, nausea or kind of an upset stomach, vision changes. Sometimes I'll get tunnel vision if I'm, you know, experiencing performance anxiety. So there are all of these things that are happening to you when you start to get a little bit nervous. So I kind of want to talk about where that originates. So we have our central nervous system and our central nervous system is basically um, the control center of, you know, the response of, okay, I have to pick up a glass or you touch a hot stove and you pull your finger away. Um, and then you have your peripheral nervous system, which is kind of like those things on the, the outer portion, um, what, we, what we call, um, sensory responses and physical responses. So in, in all of that, when we break down the central and peripheral nervous system, um, well, let me just read this here. The, the nervous system is divided into two major regions, the peripheral and the central. And so the central nervous system is also known as the CNS, and that consists of the, the brain and the spinal cord. And the spinal cord will transmit information for the brain to process. 
The brain is contained within the cranial cavity of the skull and the spinal cord is contained within the vertebral cavity of the vertebral column. Now the peripheral nervous system is everything else. It's kind of like a power plant in the nervous system. It acts like a system that collects information and sends commands. Where it's important to us is the peripheral nervous system is divided into two systems, the automatic nervous system and the sensory somatic nervous system. So what we're really gonna focus on is our, is our automatic nervous system. So when we talk about the automatic nervous system, we're talking about things that we can't control. We automatically breathe. Uh, we automatically sleep. These, these things that the brain just kind of takes care of. Well, in the automatic nervous system, it's broken down into two sections. You have your parasympathetic and your sympathetic. And I wanna talk about both because they're kind of a yin and yang. They work together in a symbiotic relationship. The sympathetic nervous system is where our fight or flight response takes place. So when we have a perceived threat, if we are, um, if we're running away or if we have to stand and fight, or if we're about to go out on stage and perform, the body considers it a perceived threat. And so it's going to send signals to different parts of our body to be able to respond to that threat. Now, conversely, the parasympathetic system is called our rest and digest system. And that one is the one where, uh, where the heart rate is lowered and the pupils are constricted and you have your, your digestive system is resting. And what we wanna do is we don't want one to kind of overpower the other. The body likes homeostasis, it likes to be balanced. So when we're experiencing fight or flight, we're, we're responding to stress. And, and that too much of that can be negative on our whole body as a whole. So um, as I said, this is just um, kind of like a little verbiage on the parasympath parasympathetic and sympathetic. Um, one of the most interesting things uh, about the automatic nervous system is that the nerves synapse in a clump of nerves called a ganglion before the message is transmitted to the target organ. All right, so we have these things that are kind of happening to us that just are automatically triggered. So what does that mean for us as musicians? Um, I, I'm gonna, I have a video that I would like to show you before my presentation is over, but when we have a perceived threat, the body will send a message to the heart to increase. That way blood is traveling all over um, to your muscles, to your vision, preparing you to uh, fight or run away. But this can be really difficult when we're trying to make a beautiful phrase or we're, we're going to be performing on stage, we're not running or fighting anything, but the body doesn't recognize that. It just sees us, it sees it as a perceived threat. And so what, what one of the biggest things that we can do is to try to deactivate the sympathetic nervous system by engaging the parasympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system. So what are some of those things that we can do? Um, when we feel anxious, of course, many of you have already heard this, so this might be just a regurgitation, but if you're feeling anxious and you have that increased heart rate and you have that tunnel vision and you're about to walk out on stage and you're feeling like, oh my gosh, I can't do this. Um, these are some tips that can kind of help you. Um, most important, it's important to understand why the body is doing what it does. So um, the things I have listed on the screen will kind of help you engage the parasympathetic nervous system to offset the stress that you're feeling um, with performance anxiety. So what are some of these? We can limit our caffeine and sugar intake. We can make better choices about what we put in our bodies before we're about to perform. Um, we can try to shift the focus off of ourself and um, the fear of, to the enjoyment that you're providing for your listener and trying not to focus on what could go wrong, but focus on the positive. So as you can see, I have a whole list of uh, things here. The most, the most important thing I think is to 
you know, be yourself, be good to yourself, um, understand what you put in your body will, you know, affect you as you perform. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to stop my share for a moment, and then I'm going to, um, I want to go and play this video for you. And I think this will give you a really good understanding of the fight or flight system. We're not seeing a video. You can't see it? No, no, Laura, you have to reshare your screen just with the video. I have to share it? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Just a moment. My bad. Can you see it now? Yes, perfect. Okay. Thank you. If there's audio, we can't hear it because I think you need oh. to make sure to check the box when you share the screen. There are four steps to the there fight or flight response. Step one is the sensory perception. Step two is brain processing the information. Step three is sending messages to the body. And step four is the physiological response. We will begin by first discussing step one, sensory perception. This step requires sensory information from your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and or touch to be collected. This information is then converted to electrical impulses through specialized cells. For example, the eyes contain photoreceptor cells including rods and cones that convert visual information to electrical signals. The electrical signal is then transported by neurons to the brain. We will now be discussing step two of the fight or flight response, brain processing. Information from the sensory organs travels to the thalamus in the brain. The thalamus is considered the relay station of the brain, collecting information and sending it for processing. The thalamus will send the information to a part of the brain called the amygdala. The amygdala is responsible for processing emotion and fear. The amygdala will assess the situation and will then send the information to a part of the brain called the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus controls the sympathetic nervous system and the endocrine system. This results in the hypothalamus releasing corticotropin releasing hormone, or CRF, to signal the pituitary gland, which is an endocrine gland, to release adrenocorticotropic hormone, or ACTH, into the blood. The hypothalamus also activates the sympathetic nervous system. In this third step of the fight or flight response, we discuss the messages being sent to the body. The anterior pituitary gland releases ACTH, which travels through the blood and stimulates the release of the stress hormone cortisol from the adrenal cortex. At the same time, the sympathetic nervous system synapses with the adrenal medulla and leads to the release of adrenaline. The fourth and final step of the fight or flight response is the physiological effect. The adrenaline that was released from the adrenal gland now leads to various physiological changes throughout the body. Adrenaline stimulates the liver to convert glycogen to glucose so that more energy is available to skeletal muscles. Adrenaline also stimulates the heart to pump at a higher rate to deliver a higher cardiac output to the skeletal muscle. And you have two minutes. Nourished with glucose, Thanks. Oxygen and nutrients to be able to work more efficiently in preparation for the response. It also stimulates the intercostal muscles to function at a higher rate to increase the breathing rate which in turn increases blood oxygen levels while removing CO2 from the blood at an equally higher rate. Adrenaline also leads to the vasodilation of blood vessels to the skeletal muscles and vasoconstriction of the blood vessels to the digestive system so that more energy is directed towards the fight or flight response. Finally, the fight or flight response also leads to dilation of pupils, 
tunnel vision, and the loss of hearing. In summary, the fight or flight response occurs in four simplified steps. One, sensory perception. Two, brain processing. Three, relay of information through electrical impulses. And four, physiological response. All these adaptive bodily responses are designed to keep us alive. As a result, they occur quickly. As demonstrated throughout this video, the fight or flight pathway. Okay, I know I'm about out of time, but I really wanted to just kind of show everyone um, what, what is physically happening in our body when we start to have that fight or flight response. And hopefully that will give you some kind of overview so that when you start to feel that increase, increased heart rate, or if you're having that tunnel vision, or if you're having dry mouth, or you have stomach upset, you kind of have a basic understanding of why it's happening and where it's coming from and how we can engage our parasympathetic nervous system by meditative breathing, by just trying to lower our heart rate or to you know refocus ourselves, recenter ourselves. Um, you have you kind of understand now what is physically happening in your body. If you have any questions, just please let me know. Um, I'm fascinated by this. I'm fascinated. We have to move on. Okay, thanks. Okay. Jessica? Our next presenter is Jonathan Kohler. He's going to be sharing some information with La about Latin works, Latin American works for clarinet and piano. So let me get the spotlight on Jonathan here and we will jump right in. Hi everybody, um, can you hear me okay? Does this sound good? Yes. Okay, great. So I thought I'd talk to you about um, the, the, the Latin works that I know best. Uh, they're the ones that I put on my most recent recording called Latin Journey and um, give you kind of an overview of some of the really great works of the last 50 years or so. Um, and I'd, I thought I'd start by telling you a little bit about um, uh, the general characteristics. As most of you probably know that most Latin music is um, associated with, largely with dance, um, but also love songs and um, great human emotion. Um, but so as we go through these different composers, I, I have uh, four composers that I'm talking about today. Carlos Guastavino from, uh, from uh, Argentina, um, Arturo Marquez from Mexico, and Paquito Di Rivera, originally from Cuba, now from New Jersey. Um, and then, and the other fourth composer on the CD, uh, Gina Stera, I'm not going to talk too much about because we actually included a that was a piano piece on the disc, and you guys are all clarinetists, so I'm just going to stick to the clarinet stuff for now. Um, so let me share with you, first of all, uh, the booklet from the CD, and I'm going to read you a couple of interesting quotes from it. So let me share my screen, first of all, and hopefully this all works as it did before. So you can see the cover now, right? So that's me, and that's my pianist, Rasa. And um, I just wanted to read you some interesting quotes. Carlos Guastavino was probably the most famous of the Argentinian composers. He died, um, oh, about, uh, let me think, about 20 years ago, around, around two, oh, 2000, it says right there. Yeah, about 22 years ago. In fact, shortly after I met, um, uh, after Luis Rossi came to one of my festivals, he, he had passed away. But he was known, and he was sort of um, boohooed for being a melodist. And um, he, in the time when it was fashionable to write 12-tone modern music, he was writing beautiful music with melodies, and I love some of his quotes. He said, for example, why can't I use the harmony that served Brahms so well? And then he said, I, I love melody, I love to sing. He wrote hundreds of songs. He was very famous for songs. In fact, he was called the, the Schubert of the Pampas which is an area in, in Argentina. He says, I refuse to compose music only intended to be discovered and understood by future generations. In other words, he wanted to write good stuff. And he didn't have much nice to say about 12-tone music. He said, according to Luis, 
It seems to be music, but it is not. I'm sure there are some here that would disagree with that. Maybe Bob. <laughs> but anyhow, Guastavino didn't like the 12-tone stuff. So his music is very, very melodic. And I think, I personally think, and I know Julie, um, Julia has recorded the piece too, I think his sonata is on a par with any of the other clarinet sonatas, even, even the Brahms sonatas, as some, uh, although some might argue with me. Let me play just a, a couple of seconds from the opening of his um, sonata for clarinet and piano, and I'll show you the score at the same time. So you already hear in that, this is, you already hear both um, rhythmic dance stuff, but in particular, this is the tonada kind of Latin music. That's a common term. Tonada just means a song, um, but it, it usually refers to a love song. And so many of the pieces you'll hear, in fact, um, uh, Guastavino actually wrote a piece called Tonada. He just named it Tonada. Um, when Luis Rossi, was just uh, 16 years old. And for those of you who don't know, Luis is a famous clarinetist and a clarinet maker. He makes the clarinet that I play, this Rossi model clarinet. Um, but anyhow, he met Guastavino when he was 16 and asked him to write something. And so Guastavino wrote for him, when he was 16 years old, two pieces, one called Tonada, the other called Cueca. He put them together and he called them Tonada y Cueca, which means Tonada and Cueca. And the tonata is actually a rearrangement of a piece that he had already written for piano called uh, Mariana. It's one of his presencias pieces uh, about different people. And this is a, a beautiful, again, love song, slow music, lyrical, with all kinds of dynamic shaping throughout. The cueca was also was a song that he wrote. Um, that's this piece. And it was... Um, the song's name was uh, Ma Vigne de Chapanay, which is my, my vineyard in Chapanay, which is the wine producing area in the north of Argentina. And it's a song of a, a vineyard keeper talking about his wonderful vineyard and, and the blooming of the, of the plants and so forth. And in this case, Guastavino did more than just a transcription. He actually added new stuff. So all this stuff you see, for example, in the opening, in the clarinet, all this stuff, is not in the original song. It's stuff that he made up for the clarinet to make it a more clarinet style piece. But you know, this is actually very typical, another typical feature of all Latin music, the, the two and three thing. So there's lots of pieces where you'll have two and three, meaning uh, it'll be like, let's say it's in six, eight, and you'll go one, two, three, four, five, six, one, and two, and three, and one, two, three, four, five, six, one, and two, and three. And so this two against three thing is everywhere. And you, you hear it here in this open opening where he starts out going. So already he's done the two against, so he's got the three. Now the three, the two. And throughout here, he's going, he goes back and forth all the time. Or when he plays... Uh, again, you got the threes, the twos. And you'll hear this element developed everywhere. So um, in all the Latin composers. And the more modern ones, they'll throw in fives and sevens, etc. But it's the same idea. I'll show you. Um, let me quickly go to... 
another piece in here. So here's another love song that, that um, Guastavino wrote. This was his one called Rosita Iglesias, who was a violinist at the Buenos Aires Conservatory with him. And he wrote this for her, originally a violin piece. Luis did a transcription of it, and I modified it a little bit and recorded it here. And you see, even in this, right from the beginning, the pickup note is a quarter note, because that's in three. And then the first measure is in two. And then the next measure is in three. The next measure is in two. The next measure is in three. So you hear that all over the place. But, but he adds syncopation on top of it. So you have. So the three against two thing is omnipresent and it gets, starts to get more complicated. Um, when we get into Patito di Rivera, he takes it even further because he gives us dances from Cuba and from um, uh, all the different Latin American countries. Let, let's take a look at, before we look at the Zarabandeo, let me talk about one of Paquito's pieces. He wrote a new piece that I played on this CD called La Fleur de Cayenne. He sent it to me in 2015. And it's, it's based on the Venezuelan Joropo. And Joropo is, which literally means party, it's the national dance of Venezuela. And it has the whole 3-2 three, three, thing. But on top of it, he adds all kinds of syncopations. The actual Joropo dance has 36 steps in it. It's, it's more complicated than a tango dance. And so, when you get in, let me play just a little bit from the recording of that. I could play a little for you, but I think it sounds better on the recording. Let's see. Let me find it here. I think it's this one here. Let's take a look. <laughs> You hear the three against two, but it's all offbeat now. He throws in all these articulations which create different rhythms. So instead of just or so you can hear the beat goes all over the place depending on where the articulation is. So I always say it's a challenge to figure out where the beat is when you're listening to this music. But uh, there was an interesting post by Paquito, actually a few days ago, um, complaining about um, non-Latin musicians trying to play Latin music and putting in too many glisses, and basically said, don't do that. He said, pretty much just, if you don't know Latin music, pretty much just play what we wrote and it should come out about right. So that's, um, when people see this music, they, they often try to add a lot to it, but um, it's all written there for the most part. There is some style to how you attack notes and so forth, but if you simply throw in lots of glisses everywhere, it actually changes the style. One of the interesting things in the middle of this piece is he throws in another dance, which some of you may know, called the salsa. So right in the, in the middle here, uh, right um, here, he says salsa feel. This is a salsa here. He goes into two. Instead of six, it's in four now. <laughs> That stuff. And with the piano, the piano is playing ba 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 all this all over the place. Let me see if I can find that and just play a little for you. It's right after that. Here it goes. It 
so beautifully written <clears throat> by minutes. Pikita. Thanks, Bob. Um, it's so beautifully written. You pretty much you just play what's written, and it sounds fantastic. So that's that's another kind. Um, let me show you another famous dance, which is called the danzon, uh, originating in Cuba, but it, it's also an ancient dance. It's it's a slow dance. And the middle section of this piece, Invitacion al Danzon, which is obviously Paquito's play on, on Weber's you know, piece, The Invitation to the Dance. But his invitation is to the Danzon instead of to the dance. And so in the middle of that, um, we hear this. The opening is a lot of fast things like this. That kind of stuff. But then when we get to the dance, the Danzon is a laid back, slow dance. And for those of you who don't improvise, this section in his music is improvised. But so what I did, since I don't, I'm not a great danson improviser, I just got a recording of Paquito and transcribed exactly what he played when he recorded the piece. He recorded it, it's originally for trio with cello. And then he sent this to me, he made this duo version for me the next year in 2009. We premiered it over at his, at his house, actually, at a 100th birthday party for Benny Goodman. So I just wrote out what he did, because he's the best. So, and I couldn't figure out a better improvisation. Um, so if anybody's interested in getting that, drop me a note and I'll be happy to you know, send you my, what I wrote out there for that, that uh, solo. And let's see, do we have one minute left here? Um, we got Contradanza. Let me just show you one other piece on here. About about 15 seconds. 15 seconds? <laughs> the, okay, the other piece was Zarabandeo by, by uh, Arturo Marquez, the great Mexican composer. And this has that same 3-2 stuff, but he adds in making it in um, 8, uh, you know, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2. So he throws in the, the multimeter oddball. I'll just play two seconds of that for you so you can hear that. Um, let's see where that is. No, it's back here. There it is. Just the opening of that. Better, so there, we, there it we, is. We better move on. Yep. So there it is, my Thanks, survey man. of Latin music. <laughs> okay, Jessica. Thank you so much, Jonathan. We're going to move on to our final presentation here um, with Julia Heinen. She's going to be talking to you about the art and the craft of clarinet playing. So I'm going to switch the spotlight so that we can move on. Great. And Jonathan, if you could unshare. Yep. Just did. Okay. All right. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm so happy to get to present today. I'm going to be talking about um, the art and craft of clarinet playing. And really, uh, what this is going to be is how to organize your practice. Um, ooh, but I can't get my thing started here. Let me try this. Okay. Is that sharing? Yes. Great. Fantastic. Okay. So, um, the first thing, if, if, uh, any of you know me, you could, you would probably think, let's see, how can I describe her? And you might come up with the word organized. And that is exactly, uh, what I want to talk about when you're practicing clarinet and you have to practice both the craft of playing the clarinet and the art of playing the clarinet. So every day um, I come up with a practice plan and my plan is pretty consistent day by day. It's very consistent in some ways and it depends on what my process is for other um, things. But the first thing I do every day when I practice is I set my intention. What am I going to do today? What do I need to do? And how am I going to accomplish this or work on accomplishing it? Um, so the first thing I do is warm up. And uh, 
I have a specific way to warm up and I'll share that with you. Um, but that's also when I'm getting my reads going and working on my reads and making sure that I'm playing through every one of my reads every day. Because if I don't play through my reads, I'm not going to have reads ready for performances. Right after I warm up, I go to on playing some slow 19th century etudes. Um, and I'll do four, three or four of these, sometimes five. Um, but I'm practicing that um, right after I warm up to give myself another a longer time to practice. Uh, when I'm warming up, I'm playing scales and things, and I'll share that with you in a minute. But then right after I do all of that, then I move into playing slow etudes where I can work on controlling the sound. And um, I actually, you know, I do my etudes standing up, but I recently, I shouldn't say recently, but about uh, five weeks ago, I started doing all my warm up standing up. Um, just to see, hey, what's my what's the effect of this on uh, my playing? After I do my uh, slow etude practice, then I go to technical passages that need attention. Um, then I move into doing complete sections, movements, entire works, and programs in their order. Then I go into score study. Then I'm going into listening, and then I do a reflection with a journal, and then I rest. And I have a lot of students who um, always are asking, you know, hey, how much time should I practice? And honestly, there's a point of diminishing returns when you're practicing. Um, so there's, you actually need to let yourself rest so your body has a, can, first of all, your mind can organize what you've put in there for the day. But also, like Laura was talking about, let these small muscles rest because it's very easy to overuse them. And that is not a good idea because it can take you several days to recover. So the first thing I do when I do my intention is I review my notes from the previous day. And I actually keep um, a practice journal. I'm not sure if you can see that. But um, so like when I'm looking at what I practiced yesterday, which is right here, I keep a note of it. Then I actually look at my journal and what it says for yesterday, I'm working on a piece by Dan Kestner. It says, do Kestner page 13. Work on the flow from section to section. This is not in my head, the form. Then start the section flow. These are notes that make perfect sense to me, but it's like I review them. Okay, this is what I'm actually gonna work on and it structures my day to do that. Um, what do I want to accomplish today? That's I've gotten from my notes. And then what's my specific plan for each section of my practice? And so my specific plan for today is I need to learn this last bit of the Kestner. I need to start working it into um, the flow of the piece. So it's not that my intention may not shift while I'm practicing. It certainly could because problems arise and all kinds of interesting things. But um, it gives me a focus and I have a plan. Practicing to just practice for the number of hours doesn't do me any good. And if any of you have a way that you want to, that just practicing randomly works for you, let me know because I would love to randomly practice. It would be my favorite thing. So the first thing I do when I practice is I warm up. I do my long tones, I do my diatonic scales, I do my scales and thirds, I do arpeggios and tonguing, and then whatever contemporary techniques I am currently making use of. So if it's circular breathing, something like that, or flutter tonguing, things like that, I actually practice that at the end of my warm up. Um, then I go into 19th century slow etudes. I'm working on this for breath control. When I'm warming up, I am playing through scales and long tones, but I'm not playing constantly for three to five minutes like an etude would give me. So now I'm actually gonna practice 19th century slow etudes and I'm saying 19th century slow etudes because that is our common practice period that we actually need to practice phrasing. Before I ever start an etude, I think about what is my intention for this etude? What is the emotion that this etude is telling me? What do I want to portray to the audience? And then I actually think about that before I start. I gather myself and then I play it with that intention in mind. 
Um, the intention does not have to be right. If I'm actually sight reading an etude, I'm looking through it and saying, okay, what am I actually, what does this sound like to me? Oh, this sounds like um, the love that a, that a newborn, that a mother has for a newborn infant. This is what that, and I'll start to play it with that idea. And sometimes I get into it and I think, no, that's not right. So then I'll change my intention. But I'm listening to what is happening and I'm practicing what the emotional effect of the piece is. But in truth, I am also practicing from what was shorter amounts of time playing to now something where I have to concentrate through something for three to five minutes. And I'm not yet to the length that a movement would be, but I'm working towards it. I'm working on dynamic inflections in an etude, which I do in my warm up. But it's less consistent because when I start my warm ups, I start with what I want to do with this, which is like my mezzo forte long tones. And then I'll add dynamics as I'm going through. But now I'm using all kinds of dynamic inflections within a shorter amount of time. And then I'm listening to myself while I'm playing. Now it's not that I'm not listening to myself while I'm doing my warm ups, I absolutely am. But they're so. Uh, they're so ingrained in me that I have to constantly remind myself to listen. Um, at least three times a week, I'll record myself playing one of these etudes or two or three, and I listen back. And I actually say, am I hearing in my recording what I thought I was doing? And I have to say that a lot of times my answer is no. I thought it was really making a big difference there, but I can't hear it. Okay, so if I can't hear it, the audience certainly can't hear it. So then I'll go back and record it again and say, okay, I really have to remind myself to exaggerate this here. What am I going to portray? Or the emotional intent that I thought I should put into this etude is entirely wrong when I'm listening to it from a listener standpoint. Oh, and then I'm asking myself, what do I want? What is this etude telling me to do? And it's all great to be wrong about this. And it's great to be right about it. But it's so nice to be wrong about it because then it forces me to think. One of my favorite things to do um, is to play a piece that I don't like. You know, I'll listen to a piece and I'll say, oh, I hate that piece. Okay, well then for me, I, I'm i drawing to play that piece because I want to know why don't I like this piece? What's wrong with it? And then I'll start to learn it and I work on it and, it, and it's, it's difficult for me and I get it into my soul finally. And then it's like, okay, I didn't like this piece because I didn't understand it. 100% of the time, that is my answer. Oh, that's why I didn't like it. And sometimes I actually have to play a piece myself in order to understand it. So I work on doing things like that. And let me tell you, if I listened to it and I didn't understand it, wow, I can't even imagine what non-clarinetists are hearing. So I'm drawn to do things like this. Then I move on to playing complete sections of pieces or movements or entire works. Um, and also the works that I'm going to do in the order that I'm going to play them in a recital because a recital has a flow to it and there needs to be um, continuity from moving from one piece to the next and how does this work and should we um, program something in a different order because of what was programmed before or after it or Physically, do I actually need to do something earlier in a program rather than something later? Um, so I practice in a performance-geared way. If I'm going to play a recital in, the, in this order, I practice the pieces in that order when I'm practicing this. Um, I'm also working on endurance for performance. Hey, I actually want to know what it feels like to play this piece as the sixth piece on a six recital, a six piece recital program. I mean, play it at the beginning, piece of cake. Play it after you've been playing for 65 minutes. Okay, that's a different animal. So I really wanna know what does it feel like? 
but I'm working on the flow of what is going to be a presentation to an audience. And what do I actually have to have to do to make this program work and to make it work for me so I can leave the stage after a piece and feel excited to come back on for the next piece. Like I cannot wait to play it. Um, oh, sorry. Next thing I spend time on, score study. I like to, uh, I'm not a person, I like to hear the entire work in my head. Um, and I, ha I have a tendency to never listen to pieces that I'm learning, um, recordings of pieces until I know it, because I wanna know what it is. I don't wanna know what somebody else does with it. Um, so I'm studying the score and I'm hearing the entire work. Oh, this makes sense for me to take time here, but it doesn't make sense for what's going on with the piano. Or let me actually think about this. What am I going to have to do with a pian with my collaborative artist? Are we going to make this choice together? And the pianists that I work with, yes, we make the choices together. What's going to work here? Um, I want to know the entire work. I was like, wait a minute, I have to play here, um, you know, this. I was actually rehearsing something a few months ago where it's like I had to come in double forte on something that was very high, and, the, and there was a downbeat in the piano, and it was pianissimo. And I was like, wait a minute, wow, this is actually startling to me that I have to come in on the end of one, but the piano's going to play pianissimo on one. I mean, what's the, what's the reason for that? Well, the reason for that, I'm sure, is the composer wanted a shocking moment for the clarinet to come in. And it wouldn't have been as shocking if the piano played louder. So it's really helpful for me, for me to know things like that. Um, and then the, my other thing when I study scores is I want to know where the silences are. And I want to make sure that I'm honoring the silence as part of the music. Am I rushing into something too quickly because I'm afraid to leave silence in a piece of music? And we all have to have silence um, as part of music and we have to honor them. And let me tell you, on stage, silence seems incredibly long. About and two minutes. Truth, thanks. And in truth, it's not. So. I want to make sure that that is being honored in music. Listening, it's a really important part of my practice day. I'm hearing and internalizing what others do, but I have a tendency to listen to not pieces that I'm working on. I, I want to know, hey, what is somebody else doing? And I also like to listen to not clarinet players for a lot of this. I, I spend a lot of time listening to string players and singers. Um, I want to expose myself to new sounds, interpretations, timing of silence, and hearing the whole work. Did this work for me? You know, did this performance move me? Did I really enjoy it? And I'm listening to live performances or recorded live performances. Um, recordings are a different animal, but I love to hear what somebody does live. Um, and how do professionals sound doing this work or other works? You know, uh, my students will ask me, hey, I listen, you know, what can I listen to? And I'll say, well, how about this and this and this? And they go onto YouTube and they find any recording. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Make sure the recordings that you're gonna listen to are actually recordings of somebody who's lived with this piece for a long time. Um, and then I like to listen to works, uh, other works that the composer had. Is this work typical? Or is it not typical for that composer? And then I do my reflections with a journal. What did I accomplish today? What did I not accomplish? What are my thoughts on my plans for tomorrow? What are my thoughts on my plan for the rest of the week? And what are my long-term plans? And I spend a lot of time visualizing upcoming performances, rehearsals, and practice sessions and working through them in my mind because that saves me a lot of time when I'm actually rehearsing. Um, and I like to check things off of lists and so I have like, these crazy plans that I work in and I'm constantly uh, it makes me feel good when I can check something off so and then I'm resting and I'm letting my brain work and organize things for what it worked on today and what it's going to do tomorrow so practice being an artist 
whenever I'm practicing, I have that in my head. What am I going to do with this? I'm not going to sit in my 110 square foot studio. I am going to practice this as if I'm on stage. And actually, I love practicing like it's on stage um, because it makes it fun and it makes it worthwhile doing it. So feel free to contact me with any questions you have, and I'm happy to uh, I'm happy to share my methods with any of you. Thanks. We switch the view back in the gallery. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for uh, that great presentation, Julia. And thank you, Jonathan. And thank you, Laura, for those great presentations. Um, panelists, if you have uh, resources like your slides or any links to uh, scores for people to purchase, please send them to me in an email, and I will put them on the page with the program notes so that people can access those if you, uh, if you are interested in that. Um, next up on our schedule pull up the link here we have our featured student um, performer recital which um, again as Julia mentioned in the welcome session is the first time that we've offered this so I'm very very excited I can promise you I've heard the recordings everybody sounds amazing and the repertoire is so interesting so I know you're gonna love that um, here's the link for the program there and you can also find the performance on YouTube here and we are going to just pop right over there that recital starts in, in 10 minutes so grab a drink use the bathroom and we will see you on YouTube in just a few minutes if you join this session late I'm going to edit it and put it up on YouTube as soon as I can so this link will transition from being zoomed to YouTube as soon as that's available okay thanks and we'll see you in about 10 minutes <laughs>